up. I was so enjoying that. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you here this morning. It is truly good to gather together in our Father's house. Mr. Hamaker, always good to have you with us, sir. Good to see you. Um, would you like a seat of honor, or are you just going to? Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, Jim. Appreciate it. So Good to see all of you. It's good to be here this morning. Beautiful fall morning. The season has come. Now it's time to bring out the long sleeves and the woolies and all that kind of stuff. But hey, it's, it's, it's time. So join me, if you will, in reading our life verse for October. It comes from uh, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 35. And we're going to be preaching and teaching and learning about this in a little while. Let's read these words together. It is more blessed to give than to receive. We're going to continue our special offering for global world hunger today, and that will go through next Sunday. So you have a couple of opportunities now to contribute to that if you would like. Uh, if you already have, thank you very much for that. If you haven't yet, there are some special envelopes uh, on the back table, as well as some information to help you understand a little bit more what, um, what we do, what this, what this uh, offering does to help to fight against world hunger. I want to remind the Fellowship of Deacons, our October meeting is going to be this afternoon at 2. That will be a Zoom meeting. Uh, if you need information on that, check with me or check with Debbie. Uh, and do the same thing also for Wednesday night Bible study. Our Wednesday night Bible study will continue. We're going to be journeying, we are journeying through the, uh, the wonderful book of Hebrews. Uh, chapter 11 is the focus of our study this week. And if I might say so myself, chapter 11 is probably my favorite chapter out of that book, but anyway. Uh, join us if, you would, if you'd like. Uh, it's never too late to, to join our Bible study. Wanted to let you know that we've adopted a, a family with five children to, from the uh, South Richmond Center for Christmas this year, and we have adopted a family with four children from the Middle District uh, Christmas, for, to help support the Middle District Christmas store this year. I will have all of that information for you next week. Um, we will be putting leaves on the giving tree uh, with the items that they are requesting, and I hope that you will help uh, participate and be a part of that. We have until Sunday, November 28th to collect all of those things, um, and I'll give you more information next Sunday when we have, when we have, all, of the, uh, when we have all of the items listed, but uh, it's one family with five children, one family with four children, and I know that in the past, y'all have just been so incredibly generous with helping these families, and I know once again, there's at least two families in our area whose kids are going to have a much better Christmas than they originally thought because of you. So thank you all very much for, for helping with that. Let's go ahead and start our time of worship now with a word of prayer. As we gaze upon your creation and celebrate all of its goodness, Father God, we cannot help but offer you praise for all that you have given to us. We enter your holy sanctuary singing your praises and sharing our prayers of thanksgiving. We humbly bow in your presence and call to you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Good morning, y'all. You can stand as you're able to sing, Here I Am to Worship, and you'll see the lyrics here on the overhead. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow to the wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted. Glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. 
Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost, it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether worthy, altogether lovely, altogether wonderful to me. Amen. Please be seated. I love it when he brings out the tambourine, don't you? So as we continue now in our time of worship, we come to that time when we Join our hearts and our minds together and lift to God those joys and concerns that we have. I want to ask you to please continue to pray for our church and for our church family, especially those who are on our prayer lists. Uh, please continue to keep the Ayers family and the Utz family in your prayers as well as they go through a very difficult time in their lives. This is the time to share with God those concerns, those joys that you have in your life, never let your concerns outnumber your joys because you have so many more blessings than you do concerns. Don't ever forget that. We are all so richly blessed. Take a moment now. Pray to your Heavenly Father and then listen for His response. Let's go to the Lord together. God of righteousness, you did not spare your own son, but you sent him here to earth to show us the way back to you. And so we come before you this morning and give you thanks for the gift of Jesus, our Lord and our shepherd, our example of what a true servant is called to be. Jesus taught us what it means to be sensitive to the needs of others, to be sympathetic to their cries and to be willing to live a sacrificial life of service to others. Our Lord loved us so much that he was willing to suffer on the cross on our behalf. And even though he was afflicted, he remained faithful to his calling. Lord God, we ask you to give us the same measure of grace to share in these difficult times in which we live. This morning, Holy Father, we pray for the Utz family and for the Ayers family and for our church family. We pray as these families celebrate the lives of their loved ones who even now are in your heavenly kingdom. 
We thank you, Lord, for receiving Robert and Christopher into your loving presence, for healing all of their physical and earthly ailments. And we pray that you will help the families to go through this difficult time. We pray that they will hear and they will feel the love that comes from this church and from their families and their friends. We ask you, Lord, to surround them with your loving arms. Equip them as they move forward in faith, knowing that their loved ones are forever healed. We also beseech you, great physician, to be with those in our church family and our community who are struggling with physical, emotional, and spiritual challenges in their lives right now. Lord God, we pray for our nation. We pray for an end to the violence that is destroying so many young lives in our cities and around our country, including right here in the Metro Richmond area. Father God, we know things are not the way you planned them to be, but we also know that if we hold fast to your word, that your kingdom will come here on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for our brothers and sisters whose needs are known to us and also for those whose needs are only known to you. May we be sensitive to the, the pain and the hurts of those around us and may we respond with patience and with compassion. And now we pray, come Holy Spirit, come and inspire each one of us as you did Paul, that we too may pass on our faith and our commitment to the next generations, just as Paul taught us. Keep us strong and courageous, even in the midst of injustice and evil in our world. These and all prayers we lift to you by joining our hearts and our voices together Praying as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If y'all can stand as you're able to sing number 339, Not What My Hands Have Done, all verses.
today's reading is from the book of Acts, verse 20, 20, verses 32 through 35. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these words which express to us the meaning of work, the meaning of service, the meaning of being a Christian. We ask you to bless these words and take, that we may take them to heart and carry them with us to this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. When I am down and oh my soul so weary, when troubles come and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. shoulders you raise me up 
to more than I can be. You raise me up to more than I can be. Thank you, Jonah. Take that, Josh Groban. <laughs> you know, we have been reading verse 35 all month. What's it say? It is better to give than to receive. And that's the focus of the message this morning. But as Jimmy was reading it, as he was reading the whole passage, that whole section, it, it dawned on me that this is one of the most personal glimpses we have of Paul in all of his writings. In all of his writings, this is one of the most intimate glances that we have into who this man was. We know who Paul was. We know his history. We know his background. We know that he was a he was a fierce, fierce warrior, especially when he was opposed to Christianity. And we know that he became even stronger as he, after having met Christ and after being, becoming an advocate for Christ, we, we know how, we, we know what he went through. We know how he suffered. We also know that he is mainly responsible for the growth of Christianity around the world. But, but I, I just want to share this again, because it really hit me this morning when Jimmy, when Jimmy read this. And Jimmy, thank you for the readings and for the prayers. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let me go on a little bit and just read you these last couple of verses. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and he prayed. And they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most, what grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Everything that I have done, everything that I have accomplished, everything that you have seen me do, I have done by my own hands, obviously with God's help, but I have done with my own hands. Paul is saying, I did not seek anything from anyone because my purpose, Paul says, was to serve, not to be served. So let's start off this morning by having me ask you this very simple question. How do you greet people? When you pick up your phone, what do you say? Because of where we are technologically now, we have the ability to look at our phones and go, uh-oh, it's my sister. <laughs> Click. We'll get back to her later. Or better yet, I'll listen to the message. She'll leave me a message, okay? So we have the ability to screen our calls now, right? We never had that ability, before, well, up until, you know, a few years ago. We never had that ability. And most of us probably, again, before call, before uh, caller ID, most of us, it was probably a simple hello. Is that right? Is that right? How do you greet the people when your phone rings? It's a simple question. It's a simple question. 
As many of you know, I spent my early adult years with several different careers, occupations, jobs, call them whatever you want, but I had several different ones. Everything from the restaurant business to retail management to uh, automotive repair. And then when I was in automotive repair, I wasn't fixing, <laughs> my wife will attest to this, I was not fixing cars, okay? Uh, I wasn't. I was what they call a service writer. You brought your car in, I asked you what was wrong, you told me what was wrong as best as you could. I learned how to spell kathunk at a very early age. Well, I don't know, I was driving along and all of a sudden it just went kathunk. Everything that I did all of those years prepared me for doing what I'm doing right now. I didn't know it then. When, when I was cooking burgers at Burger King, when I was stocking shelves at a retail store, and when I was helping people get their cars back on the road, I had no idea that what God was doing was preparing me for what I've done for the last 25 years, which is share his word. I had no idea. I had no idea. But what I did know, what I knew from a very early age, even before I started working, I knew that there was a part of me that had a deep desire to help other people, to serve other people. Not, not for any other reason than just because I saw so many people who needed help, and I wanted to discover ways that I could actually supply that for them. So at an early age, early adult age, I began answering the phone wherever I was with the words that I still use today here in the office when I answer the phone here. Actually, with a little change, because now it's, you know, thank you for calling Stockton Memorial Baptist Church. How can I help you? How can I help you? That's how I answer the phone. And if I'm not careful, if I've had a busy day on the phone here, and I'm not careful when I get home and the phone rings, it's, good afternoon, Stock, um, what can I do for you? <laughs> okay? It's just the way it is. It's become such a deeply ingrained part of me. Very often, though, when I ask that, it catches people off guard. They don't expect somebody, especially in our culture today, they don't expect somebody on the other end of the phone to say, how can I help you? Usually they expect to hear you say, what do you want? Let's be honest about it. That's the world we live in now. We live in a world that is not very user-friendly for those of us who are seeking to help others. But it reminds me, as I've said before, that even though helping someone today is a foreign idea in our culture, it was not for Jesus. I've told you this before, that Jesus never went out of his way to help anybody. I've told you that, haven't I? Jesus never went out of his way to help anybody. Because helping people is what Jesus came for. So it was never out of his way. I want you to go through the Gospels, and I want you to look at how many times it says, one day when Jesus was walking, traveling, journeying, whatever it is, and it just seems like all of a sudden he finds these people that are in trouble or, or are sick or have, have needs. It didn't just happen by chance, folks. It may sound like Jesus was just kind of walking through the countryside and pfft, there was somebody in trouble, and he found them. No. That was on purpose. That was Jesus' purpose in life, was to help others, was to serve others. It was the reason he came. Let me get back to Paul and this passage from Luke's writing in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The final 25 verses of chapter 20, verses 13 through 38, the verses that 
Jimmy read and then I just concluded for you are worthy of our reading and our studying if for no other reason Paul correctly believed that this would be the final time that he would be with the Christians in Ephesus. What made this particular country so important to Paul was the fact that he had spent about three and a half years there getting the, 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 the new church and getting the new Christians together and, 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 and teaching them and studying with them. That was the longest Paul stayed voluntarily in any one place during all of his missions. It was three and a half years in Ephesus. That's all it took. And Paul knew that these people that he had probably fought with and argued with and you know, you know all the things that churches don't do anymore. <laughs> but, but he knew that these people that he loved and cared about and, and had nurtured, when he got there, most of them didn't know who Jesus was. But when he left three and a half later, three and a half years later, there was no doubt in their minds who Jesus was. And he was leaving them. He felt like he would never see them again. Obviously, he had grown extremely fond of these people. He knelt down with all of them and he prayed and they wept and they embraced and they kissed. What grieved them the most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And then it closes with, after we had torn ourselves away from them. This is Paul speaking about himself and his disciples. After we had torn ourselves away from them, you can hear the, the pain in the man's voice. Consider for one moment, if you would, knowing that you will never again see a loved one. A spouse, a child, a family member, or a close friend. What would that conversation be like? I know we've talked about this before, but, but in light of everything that's happened these last couple of years, in light of a lot of the health issues that we have all faced, in light of the fact that we have lost family members from this very room, what was your last conversation like? What would you have wished your last conversation was like? I want to take a few minutes and I want to look at what I consider two of the most in, impactful points of Paul's last words to these people for whom he showed such great affection. In verses 20 and 21, Paul declared, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. I have preached to you both publicly and from house to house. What else is there? This is either public or private, right? I mean, there is, no, there is nothing else. And Paul said, I didn't care if it was a crowd or if there were three of us that were gathered together. I didn't care where I was, Paul said, I was going to preach Jesus Christ. That's how important it was to Paul. That everybody would come to know Jesus. That's how important it should be to you and me. I've preached many times about the importance of our growth in both knowledge and our relationship to Jesus Christ. And there's a dual purpose in this growth. The first being our own personal growth and our own personal change. How many of you remember a time before you knew, I mean really knew who Jesus was and how important Jesus was to you? Can you think of a time like that in your life? And look at you now. And look at you now. Look at what you have learned. Look what you have gained. Look how you have grown from within. 
You want to go back to the old way? There's nothing stopping you. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. It's not enough, and I've said this to you before, and I'm going to say it again. It's not enough that we read our Bibles. It's not enough that we hear the scripture uh, uh, read to us. We have got to live it every single day. Our personal growth is important, but so is the growth, and this is the second part, the growth of others. Listen to this. Listen. This was Isaiah. Thousands of years ago, this was Isaiah. Isaiah warned a time was coming when people will be ever hearing but never understanding, seeing but never perceiving. A time when people's hearts have become calloused. They can hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Do you know how many people were murdered in Richmond in the last 24 hours? Three. Three in the last 24 hours. Why am I the only one here that knows that? Is it because I read the news? I try not to, to be honest with you. But it's because when a single person in our area is killed, murdered, it bothers me. It still affects me. And I know it does you as well. But our world has grown so calloused to that. We are becoming the people that Isaiah warned us about. People's hearts have become calloused. They have. We hear the words, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't hurt us because why? Because it doesn't involve me directly. That's what our world has become. And, and that's not a world that we want to live in, folks. It's not. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 13. Jesus explained the parable of the sower like this. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed that is sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But since they have no root, this joy only lasts a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and make it unfruitful. That's the one. They're so close, but then life gets in the way. When, when I first became a pastor, I'm going to bare my soul to you a little bit. Like, I don't do that every week, right? I'm going to do it a little more. When I first became, well, actually before I became a pastor, when I, was, when I was considering answering the call, I would look at my pastors and, and other pastors of friends that I had, and I would think, man, all they do all day long is talk to God and listen. That's all they do. How awesome is that? They don't have any troubles. There, there, there's nothing bothering them because all they do is spend time with God. And I wanted that. I didn't want to worry about somebody else's car that had broken down. I wanted to be able to spend my whole time talking with God and listening for God and following God. So I'm going to become a pastor. How'd that work out for you, Bill? Well, it worked out great. Y'all know I love what I do. Y'all know I love you. And y'all know I love to share the word. But guess what? Life still gets in the way. It still does. It doesn't exempt any of us. It sure didn't exempt Paul. 
It sure didn't exempt Jesus. Life gets in the way. But I believe that we are the good soil. The good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. There are somewhere between 30 and 100 people out there who are waiting for you. Who are waiting for you to share this gospel with them. That's your homework assignment for this week. Start with 30, work your way up to 100. And when you get to 100, go for two. Go for two. So the first benefit of, our, of spiritual growth is our growth, our inward growth, which leads us to the second benefit. As we grow ourselves in the knowledge and the understanding and the love of Christ, we are better equipped to share it with others. I think I've told you this before. If I haven't, I need to. And, and, and Susan, of course, is going to be shaking your head on this one. I literally have every sermon I have ever preached. I have a hard copy. I have a paper copy of every sermon I have ever preached. That's been in the last 20 plus years. I, I have notebooks full of sermons. And every once in a while, sometimes it's because I'm just not feeling an inspiration. Sometimes it's because I just want to take a walk down memory lane, which I've told you never do because it can get you in trouble. Trust me, it can. And I'll open some of those early sermons and I'll, and I'll read through them. And I'll just shake my head. And, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. I, 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 was, I was not even scraping the surface. And yet these people were listening. And hopefully they were learning. And, and I'm embarrassed because of, of the level of understanding. And here I was trying to share it with others. And you know, in, in two years or 10 years or 40 years, I'm going to look back at this sermon and I'm going to go, unbelievable. But there's growth going on. There's growth going on inside of each one of us. And that growth is not just for us. It's for others as well. How many of y'all, and, and this is guys and girls, how many of y'all learned to play baseball or softball at a young age? Anybody? Okay. All right. So the coach says to you, and I'm just picking on baseball right now. It could be any sport. The coach says to you, oh man, I can hear Mr. Mott right now. Whew. That was a lot of years ago. Billy, when you're in the outfield and there's a high pop, two hands, right? Two hands. But I only have a glove on one hand, coach. That hand and then you cover the ball with the other hand. Am I right? Okay. Football players. How many football players? Come on, I know we got some football players out there. Ah, ah, ah. When you're carrying the ball and you're running, Coach Bob, what do you tell them? You just tuck it underneath? No, you cover it up. Bob and I coached football together 100 years ago, about that. You can imagine how shocked I was when I walked in here to pastor search committee and saw Bob and Debbie Long sitting at that table. So what happens when the coach who says, two hands, or cover it up, does one of these when you're out there at practice? What happens when the pastor says, be kind, be compassionate, be patient, and you see him screaming at somebody who cut him off on Hull Street the, other, the next day? Hmm? We can't just share the gospel. We have to live the gospel. Like the parent who extols the importance of church attendance to their child, but then sneaks off to play golf on Sunday morning. All of that talk loses its impact. It, 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 it just it goes away. We can't only share it, folks, but we have to live it each and every day. 
Our actions always speak louder than our words. The second most info pack, info, is getting to learn to use our mouths properly. The second most impactful part of Paul's farewell to the Ephesians is not only in verse 35, which says what? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Thank you, just making sure you're awake. But also in verse 19, where Paul says, I have served the Lord with great humility and with tears. I don't want you to think that every single person that you try to share the gospel with is going to welcome you with open arms. It's not going to happen. There's going to be some tough ones. There's going to be some tears. With great humility and with tears, Paul wrote. I want to reference this but I want to go to two passages from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul instructed the believers like this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Pastor Bill, I've got this neighbor. And I have tried to get him to come to church with me, and he just won't do it. And I don't know what to do. I don't feel like I'm gaining anything. I don't feel like anything's happening here. I, I, I. Why am I trying to get this neighbor to come to church? So that I can say, look, I brought somebody to church with me. No. No. We don't do it because of us. We do it for the Lord and for that person who is lost. I'll tell you, the hardest person to get back into a church is the one who used to go to church. You know anybody who, do you know anybody in your life who used to go to church but doesn't go anymore? That's the toughest person. That's the first one you want to try. First thing you need to do is find out what can I do to help you? How can I help you? How can I serve you? That's where it starts. Not here, come with me because you have to. No, that doesn't work. That never works. That didn't work when they were this big or when they're this big. The second thing Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 again, verses 7 through 8. And I can hear Paul saying, asking the people, do you want to be more like Jesus? Do you want to be more like Jesus? Isn't that our goal? To be more like Jesus? Paul says, Jesus made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 26, we read about what it means to have a servant's heart. Jesus literally, literally took on the role of a servant. And he washed the feet of his disciples. How many of y'all have ever participated in a foot washing? It's an interesting experience, isn't it? It's an interesting experience. And, and I'm talking about today, in, in our world today, where, you know, where we usually walk around with shoes and or socks on our feet. The disciples did not have shoes or socks. They had sandals. They had flip-flops. Where they walked was not paved or tiled or carpeted. It was dusty. And it was dirty. And if it rained, those few times when it rained, it was muddy. And Jesus, 
the man who would go to the cross for our sins got down on his hands and knees and he washed their dirty, stinky feet. That is a servant's heart. And you know, that wasn't enough for Jesus. Because after he had washed his feet, and I'm assuming took care of his own personal hygiene, he hosted and fed them the most important meal of their lives. Paul was not only an apostle, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. He was hand chosen by, by Jesus. You all remember what happened to Paul, right? He had been fighting against Christians, fighting against Christians, fighting against Christians, and one day he encountered Jesus and his life was changed forever. Paul was hand picked by Christ to carry the message of salvation to the world. And even though he had that incredible honor, like Jesus, Paul humbled himself before the people and before God. And he put on the towel of servanthood and not the robe of royalty that he really deserved. Serving others with humility. You and I can take on no greater role as we seek to help others. With the richness we have been blessed, we are instructed to bless others. Now, I know this sounds weird in the culture in which we're in. Gimme, 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 it's all about me. No. No, no. When we serve others, we are demonstrating in the most powerful way possible that we understand that life is not just taking, about taking care of ourselves, but it's about taking care of everyone else around us as well. It's serving our Lord by taking care of the needs of others. But like I said, it's not an easy task. It's not for the faint of heart. In Acts chapter 19, verses 8 and 9, Luke writes that Paul faced much oppression. He said, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke, spoke boldly there for three months. For three months, every day, Paul was in the synagogue, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. I know we can't believe that. We can't believe that they became obstinate. We can't believe that they refused to believe. Because that never happens in a church, does it? We always agree on everything, don't we? Susan's in the back going, well, maybe here we do, but I don't know about at home. <laughs> Come on, guys. Come on. Some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly, publicly maligned the way. So what did Paul do? He left them. You don't want to hear the word? You don't want to know the truth? You don't want your life to be blessed? That's all I can do. But he never stopped preaching. Paul took his disciples and those who would follow him, and he went to another place, to another synagogue, in another city, and you know what he did? He preached the same thing over and over and over again. And when the, that next town refused to believe it, he packed it up and he left. I think Paul knew Kenny Rogers really well. What did Kenny Rogers say? You got to know when to hold him. You got to know when to fold him. All right, here you go. Let me close with this. I want to give you five critical things that Paul taught us as we seek to serve others in Christ's name. Number one, serve the Lord by making yourself available. Paul spent the, the bulk of his valuable years in ministry traveling. It was very rare that Paul stayed in one place. Like I said, Ephesus was the longest he stayed in any one area. And that was only three and a half years. Can you imagine putting together a search committee every three and a half years? 
People today often say, I don't have the ability to do what God wants me to do. Folks, God will give you the ability. Trust me. God will give you the ability to do what he needs for you to do. This is coming from someone who would not stand in front of six people, let alone 60 people, and talk. This is, I'm just telling you. He doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. Okay, that's just brief. Okay, number two. Serve the Lord by being a risk taker. I can look in this room right now and I can tell you exactly who the risk takers are. I can look at one in particular and tell you he's a risk taker. But anyway. All right? Be a risk taker. Don't be foolish about it. But be willing to step beyond your comfort zone. Don't let fear run your life. It may help direct you, but don't let it run your life. I've told you before, if God calls you to it, he's going to bring you through it. We need to have a mind like Paul. Paul considered life to be a race. Paul writes about this often. He considered life to be a race that, that needed to be finished. We need to do like that. Serve the Lord by being real. Okay. Do you need an example of what it means to serve the Lord by being real? Look at your pastor. This is real. I have never hidden anything from y'all. And I don't plan on it. Sometimes it gets me in trouble. Hmm? Sometimes you find out things about the pastor that maybe you really didn't need to know, but, uh, you know... <laughs> You gotta be real about it, folks. We can't try to, you know, put on the fancy clothes and that makes us something special. No, we gotta be real about sharing our faith. People don't always want to hear the truth about God's word, but we've gotta give them the truth. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't beat them over the head with it, but we can't sugarcoat it. And be careful. They may take out their frustrations on you but we can't water down God's word. It doesn't help us, and it sure doesn't help them. Number four, serve the Lord by being humble. Serve the Lord by being humble. We have been given the most important assignment, the most important task in the world, and that is to help others gain eternal life in Christ Jesus. There is nothing else that matters. But we have to be humble about it. Again, we don't hit them over the head with it. When we're sharing the word, make sure we're not pointing to ourselves, but make sure that we're always pointing to God. Always. It's not about what I've done. It's about what he's done through me. <coughs> Number five, last point. Serve the Lord by being committed. To me, one of the saddest passages in the Bible are the verses that refer to the direction that so much of our world today seems to be going through. These were words, listen to, these were words that were written thousands of years ago. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 16, and yes, we are going to do a Wednesday night Bible study on the book of Revelation next year. I promise you that. It's important. In Revelation 3, 15 and 16, God says to the church in Laodicea, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Folks, we cannot be lukewarm Christians. We can't. We can't afford to be. The world can't afford us to be. You can't be a Christian on Sunday and a whatever on Monday. You can't. It has to, it has to be who we are all the time. All the time. 
If we truly desire to serve the Lord, we must be firmly committed, knowing that when we seek to be, when we seek to bless others, we ourselves will be blessed. Amen. If you could stand, you're able to sing number 580, O oh God of love, enable me all verses. of love, God of grace, God of hope, God of power. Come and be with your people now and forevermore. May the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you as you go out into the world and share the gospel with everyone. Be the seed, plant the seed, and then step back and watch the Spirit grow this day and forevermore. Amen.